I'll give him a call back in like uh, 12 to 15 minutes. Yeah, I'll get him up. I always get him up because I'm the greatest negotiator of all time. I'll handle it, I'll handle it. Yep, 15 minutes, okay, 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 bye. Jeez. I'm about to close a $26 million deal. Right now, one apartment, easy, showed it one time. In between getting off the phone with the seller right now and calling the buyer to get them up, I wanna give you my five principles of negotiation. This is the art of war for selling, for closing, and for negotiating. Principle number one is understanding your opponent. I try to learn as much about the other side of the transaction as I can. At a bare minimum, if there's another salesperson on the other side of a transaction that I'm doing, I wanna find their past sales. I wanna read their website. I wanna look into their LinkedIn bio. Do they make TikToks? Do they have different accounts? Are they still on Tumblr? Then, when you meet, I wanna watch their body language. I wanna to listen to how they talk. I wanna gauge the tone of their voice. Like an NFL team, I'm checking tape. I'm watching the other side, seeing how they act, how they interact, how they react. Are they looking to work together with me or are they looking to be combative? Are they putting the deal first or their ego first? Do they sound nervous or do they sound confident? And you can do this too with just a sell side person, your boss, anyone you're negotiating with. Doesn't have to be another salesperson if you're in the real estate world or another lawyer if you're a lawyer watching this right now. It can just be the other side of a negotiation. They're gonna give you signals and every little signal will help you make a quick evaluation of who you're actually going to be dealing with in the negotiation. You need to strategize on the best approach to get to a close, not for the number, not even for the deal, but for your opposition. What does the opposition need to get this deal done? Do you need to feed their ego? Whenever I'm on the opposite side of someone with a massive ego, they always wanna feel like they're winning. Maybe they have jealousy of me, or they're envious of whatever, or they're having a bad day, but they have ego. They wanna feel like they're winning. Doesn't matter what their client wants or the deal, they will blow up their whole life to feel like they won. We all know those people, and they're the fucking worst. If that's what you're dealing with, agree with them throughout the process and defer to their expertise. Suck it up. This is as simple as asking questions like, what would you do if you were in my position? Or how would you tell my client that your client won't come up? By doing this, you're gonna let them share their expertise and they're gonna feel good that they're telling you exactly what they're thinking and they're telling you what to do when really what you're doing is you're getting inside their head so that they can give you the answers. Feed their ego. Two, is the opposition new to the business? Do they need guidance? If you're dealing with another salesperson and they're absolutely brand new, it's a very different way to handle those people than handling somebody and negotiating a deal with somebody who's been in the business for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Are you dealing with a first time seller? Are you dealing with a first time boss? The secret here is to make the inexperienced opposition, either that salesperson or seller, okay, your best friend. Offer them guidance without straight out telling them what to do. So use a couple key phrases. I say, we're in this together. It's never you, it's never me, it's never I, it's us. Let's work together. We both want the same thing for our clients. I've been in your situation before, and this is what I would do. Things like that. Communicating as a friend instead of an opponent will build you trust. And ultimately, you both do actually want the same things for your clients, right? You both do want to get to that deal, but there are always ways to help each other. And understanding the person on the other side is just as important as understanding the person they are representing. And in order to do this, you must ask questions to figure out the main interests behind a position, allowing you to figure out a solution instead of being on the defense. Principle number two, acknowledge their points. Did anyone ever tell you that during an interview, you should mirror the interviewer's actions. Have you ever heard that or watch YouTube videos about it? So like if you're interviewing with somebody and they're leaning in while talking, you should also lean in while talking. If they're talking in a really soft spoken voice, you should try to match their volume. It's the same thing in sales. By emulating the other person, okay, when you are trying to get to the deal, the win, there's something you want, you emulate the other person, you're achieving one very important goal. You're making them feel comfortable. You're not establishing dominance, you're getting down to their level. You're building that trust and you're letting them know that you're not louder than them. You're not taller than them. You're not crazier than them. You're not faster than them. You and me, we're the same because you're the bigger person. You're the better salesperson. You're the one who sells more than anybody else because you know these tricks. So here's how you accomplish this. Repeat their points back to them. 
Everyone wants to feel like they're making a good case for their clients, right? Or a good case for themselves. So by doing this, you're showing, you're listening, and you're understanding, you're showing empathy. Many agents actually take this for granted when dealing with a negotiation, right? Many salespeople do. You wanna repeat back what the other side is saying to you because you're acknowledging their points. It's gonna make them feel better. It's gonna make them feel heard. I promise you will get a lot further if you treat every negotiation as a discussion and not a confrontation. The key to negotiating is you're not negotiating. Just like the key to selling is you're not actually selling. No one likes being sold, but everyone loves to go shopping and they love to shop with friends. Next thing you know, that friend just convinced you to buy five sweaters, a bicycle, and get a new car. Wasn't even the plan, I thought we were going to boozy brunch. So from here, right, as you're acknowledging their points, you can start to relate back to the other side. You're not saying, okay, tell me how you do it. Right? That's your ego talking. You're not gonna say, well, Bob, if you're so smart, you tell me what to do. Okay? Again, that's your ego talking, that's you on the defense. That's not negotiating, that's not discussing. By acknowledging the other side's feelings and reasons for not giving in to a certain sticking point on a deal, whatever it might be, and oftentimes it's really small, you're often able to get to the true interest behind the positions and then find a creative solution. For example, right now, the conversation that I'm in the middle of to get this deal done, we've agreed in theory to a purchase price. The issue is the seller's apartment we furnished, okay, by buying the furniture. But when you do that through a designer, you don't pay the sales tax until a deal closes. So now my seller wants the buy side to pay a sales tax. It's $1.2 million worth of furniture. That sales tax in New York City is about $115,000 in tax just on the furniture that the buyer thinks is used. I'm not paying tax on it. Include the furniture to get me to buy this place for $26 million. You're gonna hit me with sales tax? I get both sides of it. So it's not even about the deal. It's not even about the money. It's about the principle. And it's my job to understand the opposition for the seller I represent and for the buyer that I'm also handling at the same exact time. Principle number three, never, ever, 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 ever push for a yes. No, you don't wanna ask questions that people can say no to. You don't say, hey, can you meet tomorrow? That's pretty easy to say, nah, I'm busy. Right? You say, how's tomorrow at 10 or four? That's hard to say, no, they have to think about it. They have to say, oh, neither of those times work. Guy will have to do the next day, right? You get people thinking, because you don't want saying no to be easy. It's like a little kid. Little kid learns the word no, it's all they say because it's easy, it's fast, it's fun. Saying no asserts dominance. I'm two years old, I learned how to speak now. You big person, no, no, I'm not gonna eat that. No, I don't wanna take it back, no. Adults in negotiating are the same. When people tell you yes, sometimes it really means no if you're pushing for the yes. Yes is an easy way to get you off the phone without having to experience the discomfort of a no because people don't like confrontation. So what you really want when you're negotiating is a no. Let me explain how this works in sales. Getting to an agreement is your ultimate goal, right? If you asked anyone that, they would probably say yes. However, it's not that simple when you're actually trying to merge a gap on a deal during a negotiation. Everyone wants to be right. Everyone wants to feel like they win. So why would they openly agree with your suggestion, especially if they want their client to think highly of them? Or if the seller wants to feel like they're winning? Get to a no, a grown up no. So for example, would it be terrible if you got your buyer up an additional $10,000. You see what I'm saying? If you asked that question, hey, would your client come up 10 grand? They'd probably say, no, this is our bottom line, absolutely not, I told you, I've given you every penny. But if you change the question, the default no actually gets you a step closer. Another example, does your seller really want to lose a qualified buyer? <gasps> see what I'm saying? By asking questions that you are sure to get a no from, you can actually work together to find a yes that works for both sides. Principle number four, let your silence do the talking. And by remaining silent, you're doing two things. One, you're letting the other agent, other salesperson, figure out the solution that you know they would accept. And two, letting the other agent or salesperson feel like they have control of the situation because they're coming to you now to break the silence because everyone hates silence. This is principle number five. Sounds simple, but man oh man, is it a tough one. Keep it positive. The second you lose control of your emotions, the deal is dead. It is super important to remain calm and positive throughout the entire deal. No one likes to negotiate when negative feelings are involved. It just doesn't. It's uncomfortable, it's confrontational, it sucks. Let's move on, right? The best deals get done when both sides are happy. And at the end of the day, for most of us, Whatever we're negotiating is probably for a good thing, right? But let's get to a happy solution. We're in this together, I'm on your side. If it's not these buyers, we'll find someone else. I will never 
quit for you. It is important to always maintain positivity during a deal, when the deal is good, and especially when the deal is bad. Because without it, there is no deal, there is no client. And then you're the person who loses more than you win. And with these principles in mind, you're gonna be able to take your negotiation skill set to the next level, but we are just scratching the surface. Play this video back, study each principle, but most of all, practice them. You're gonna close better deals when you do. Selling is a muscle. Some people have that muscle from birth. Some people have to work at it like I've had for the last 15 years. Everything I'm giving to you, I've learned through trial by fire. I haven't sold thousands and thousands and thousands of homes for billions and billions and billions of dollars of sales without learning the ups, downs, ins, outs, wrongs, and rights of every negotiation. And to become an even better closer and negotiator, I want you to do one really important thing right now. I want you to tap the link below, and I want you to sign up for my closings and negotiations course. Because I guarantee you, those that take the course are going to be the ones negotiating with you. So keep the upper hand. Ready, set, close.